All right. Welcome in, you Roll Titers. And how's everybody feeling about our football coach? I feel pretty good. I think we're going to be fine. You know, the problem with replacing a legend is you can't replace a legend. So it's, um, you know, you just can't replace him. So we're just going to have to do the best we can. And I think we've got the guy who is, uh, is, has been a winner everywhere he's gone. And so hopefully he'll continue that tradition. Jason, where'd you say you're at now? Where are you, where are you located? I'm outside of Seattle. So you guys that's grabbed right. our, uh, our hometown coach. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. I thought you were in, in Seattle. So yeah, uh, what what did y'all hear about him up there? Everybody loved him and stuff. A good coach. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We knew after this year he was probably getting scooped up somewhere else. Yeah, and then there was there was some talk. I thought, oh God, please no, about him being a candidate for the Seattle Seahawks too. Mm hmm. Yep, he was in the mix too once Carroll took off or got whatever happened to him. So the Seahawks have a coach yet? I hadn't heard. I, I'm. I think they're still doing interviews right now. I don't think they've uh, announced okay. anybody yet. Okay. Well, good. So a little football talk. Get everybody going. Hope everybody's relaxing during semester. We don't try to make this very. Uh, you know, I don't want to stress you out because it wasn't. But 2017 that I was going through the master's program at the University of Alabama in the same program that you guys are going through. So I knew how strenuous it was with me and my wife and five kids and a full-time job. So we try not to make it too strenuous on you. I want you to learn. I want you to participate. But we try not to make it overly difficult. I'm not your adversary, and I'm not here to show you how tough I am. I just want you to do the work and do the things necessary. Let's talk about Karen the Super Trader just a little bit. Uh, Zoe, did you uh, do you go by Zoe or Zoe? Zoe. That's what I thought. Zoe, did you what do you think about Karen the Super Trader? I'd like to hear your thoughts on her. Um, I thought it was a very interesting story. Um, uh, or I guess I mean it's not a story, it's real, but I do not feel as confident that I could get the same results as Karen unless I put a lot of effort into now. So are you her. more uh wanting to be a passive? investor or are you going to be an active investor with options and all kinds of hey will y'all turn that down whoever that is abby turn that off i'm in a class uh so you're going to be more active or passive do you think passive okay all right uh, nothing wrong with that guys nothing wrong with that at all good tom what did you think about hearing the super trader Uh, it was a pretty impressive journey that she took, I think. Uh, obviously, made a lot of money for herself and a lot of other people. Uh, I don't, I'm kind of like Zoe. I don't know. I really understand exactly how she was doing it, but uh, I'm, I gear more towards the side of simplicity. Well, she would have probably been better if she'd have stayed in the shadows because she did a couple of interviews with Tom Sosnoff. And the problem was that it got her out in the public, right? So she built that fund up. I think it was 141 million by the time that interview was going on. She actually built it up to 300 million. And that's when the SEC came in and shut her down and basically said the way she's charging fees for her clients was uh, against the rules and they shut her down. It's really sad. She didn't have the money to fight them. Now, I know what you're saying. She had $300 million in the account. How can you not fight them? Well, $300 million, most of it was for her clients. And she was using the profits, most of her profits, she used to uh, go to those economically depressed areas of the world. Uh, she built a pineapple plantation in Africa so people would be able to create their own money through farming pineapples. And she planted pineapples over there. I mean, it's crazy. And they shut her down and Karen can no longer manage anyone else's money. So interestingly enough, the SEC regulators that came in and talked to her didn't even know what a put was. You guys know more than the SEC regulators. And anyway, they shut her down, fined her a million dollars, blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of a tragic story. 
And the last time that I spoke to Karen, she spoke to our Alabama class, much like this. She came in and was a speaker of our class. And I don't know, she just seemed like a person that life had just left her. It was really sad to see her just so vibrant and so fun and so loving everything and to see her in such a depressed state. So anyway, we do wish her well, but I thought it was an interesting story. Anyone else got a take on Karen? I, I'll be doing an injustice to Karen if I didn't tell you that she does have a book uh, about her entire journey and that with SEC that is called The Lamb of Wall Street. So if you'd like to check that out, it's on Amazon. And uh, if you don't do further reading about Karen. Now, this week you had an assignment to sell a put, and most of you did that. I hadn't got everyone's graded yet. But one thing that you did not get right, most of you, is that what happens if the price of the stock is lower than your strike price at expiration? You said, well, we would be losing. Okay, well, yeah, but the main thing that I wanted you to take away and the thing that you've got to understand is, is not only would you be losing, but you would actually own the stock. You would wake up that next day if you did a one lot, one lot is a one contract, of the options, you would wake up the next morning and in your account would be a hundred shares of that stock that you sold. So if it was Amazon, you'd own a hundred shares of Amazon. It's not that you've got to buy it. It's put to you. You don't even have to execute a buy order. It is in your account and you've got that. So that's the main takeaway that you guys got wrong that I want you to know. You don't buy it. It's give it's it's put to you. It's forced upon you, right? You remember something when you had to you were growing up, and I remember my uncle tried to make me eat tomatoes, and now I hate tomatoes. I can't eat them because he tried to force me to eat them. You are forced these shares of stock in your account. There's nothing you can do about it. So they are yours. Now, what I want you to do this week in your paper money account is I want you to sell some puts, and go down to about a 20 or 30 delta. Everybody knows what that means. That's a 20 or 30% probability of being in the money. And I want you to do it at an expiration that is around seven uh, days, seven to 10 days. Okay, so let's see if we can share my screen so you can see how to do that. Let's see. Share the basics, share screen one. Yeah, let's look at that so you can see how to do it. So pick some companies you would not mind owning. Okay, so let's say where we're going to go and you really, really, really want NVIDIA. NVIDIA, 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 however you say it. All right, it's the one of the biggest moving stocks now. Everybody's in it. Look how many people have traded this thing today. Let's see if we can see that. Look at this, 25 million, almost 26 million shares have traded, and we still got three hours on the trading day left on the day. Oh, another thing. Some of you tried to sell a put after market hours, and that didn't work either, did it? You couldn't get filled, and you're like, why couldn't I get filled? I kept changing the price. I kept changing the price. Well, the problem was is that you were selling the put after business hours, Monday through Friday, 9 Eastern, no, 9.30 Eastern until 4 Eastern. 9.30 Eastern, 8.30 Central to 3 Central is when the markets are open. Now, there is an opportunity pre-market to order them, and there may be some time after the market, but generally those are the most liquid times for you to make sure that you're getting in these accounts, okay? So I want you to make sure that you're doing it during market time. And if you're using your phone to do it, that's fun too. So get into your account and then go hide all this stuff. Get into your account, and I want you to go into the trade tab. So we've got NVIDIA there. And I want you to go out about, you know, seven days or so, nine days here, 16, doesn't matter. But I want you to experience owning some stock in your account. And I want you to be put some shares. So go down to about a 20 or 30 delta. So we could go to a 30. 29 delta is a 30% probability of being in the money. And remember, to get delta here, click on this here and go to option theoreticals in Greek and click on delta. To get probability of in the money, go to option theoreticals are great, and it'll pull up a whole low list of things that you could click on. And so watch this. You could go down to the 30 delta, sell this. You're going to get $665, y'all, in your account. Isn't that great? So you can sell $665. 
uh, is your maximum profit, right? Your break even is at 590.95. Your max loss is if it goes to zero. The credit received is the premium that you receive minus the commission. They're charging me 50 cents. And then because this is an IRA account, they'd be charging me $59,000 worth of collateral to put up buying power. Okay. And then hit send and then go in and do several stocks right now. If you, I don't want you to do a hundred shares. I want you to do one lots. Don't, this may automatically be at a hundred, change this to one. You're selling one minus one, not a hundred. And I want you to do this for several companies and do, you know, five or seven days out. And I want you to actually get assigned some of these stocks. I hope some of these stocks go down so that you actually are assigned shares because that's going to be so fun. And then I want to show you what to do once you're assigned those shares. You don't just sit on them. Oh, no, no, no. We're going to sell calls against the shares, which is so cool. You're basically turning a shares into a, you're turning it into an income generating property, kind of like real estate. You know, you've got vacant land. Well, how about this? Somebody wants to use it for a pasture. Okay, someone wants to, to cut hay on it. Okay, you, so you're turning something that just sits there, like a stock, like NVIDIA, and you're changing it into an income property by selling premium against those shares. And if the share price goes above your strike price of the call, then that stock is called away from you. It's just the opposite of what a put is. You sell a call against it, you receive premium, right? You can still receive like the $650, but that will be uh, called away from you if it goes above the strike price at expiration. So I want you to get a sign on some shares. Go even closer. Go about a 35 delta, something that will make you really get a sign. You know, you could even sell a 50 delta. Wow, look at this. You're going to get $1,335. Look at that. And that's yours to keep. But if the stock price goes below it, you're going to be assigned shares at that six. Uh, at the strike price of 615, whereas now it's 616. Okay. But if you want to get in the stock, like today, you said, man, I'd love to buy this stock. It's down 11 bucks. I'd love to buy it at 616. Well, sell a put at 615. That's all you got to do. Really, really cool. Anybody got a question about uh, selling a put? I want you to do it on several underlines this week. Several, five, 10, you know, fill it up till you, you're using your buying power. You know, uh, one of my girls in uh, the uh, University of West Georgia class yesterday, she was so excited. She says, look, my paper account, I'm up $225. She said, that's so cool. I said, yeah, and it's fun to follow along. So sell a put, and uh, this is the active trading part, Zoe, of what you probably never want to do, but it's fun for you to know it because some of your clients may want to dabble in this, you know, and they may want, and so you need to know about options and woefully, Thankfully, the University of Alabama allows me to teach basically what I want to teach, and we cover options extensively, which is something that you need to have some exposure to. Not that you'll be doing it, but you need to know what's involved when your clients come to you and say, hey, I've been dealing in options. And you say, oh, I know all about that. We sell puts, we sell calls, you know, so we, um, you know what to do. All right. So that's enough about the active trading stuff. Let's now talk about the book because a lot of people say, well, this is an investment book and you, uh, or this is an investment class and you have written a book basically that is a, a, a finance class. How is that important? Well, it's really important for a couple of reasons. You were to cover chapters four, five, and six. It's on spending responsibly, uh, building financial resilience by the power of saving, and then the magic of compound interest, which is growing wealth over time. Ladies and gentlemen, you will never be the investor you were made to be if you spend too much money. You will never have the nest egg that you need to enjoy your golden years and also to enjoy your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, if you don't save your money and you don't invest your money. And one of the things that I've got to make sure is that you guys are not overspending. So I tried to simplify it. I tried to simplify it by saying, look, here it is. You get a $100 bill, 
you can spend seventy dollars out of a hundred dollar bill. It's so easy. That's all the budgeting you need to know. That's your car payment. That's your rent. That's your mortgage. That's your credit card bill. That's your grocery bill. That's your food bill. So the question rises: What if you can't make it on seventy percent? Well, you have to do one of two things. You've got to increase your income by getting a second job or, you know, getting a side hustle, or you've got to decrease your expenses. You say, well, I can't decrease my expenses. What do I do? Well, you've got to do the best you can to try to squeeze it all into 70%. That's the simplest budgeting technique that I know, rather than going detailed spreadsheets, spend 70% of your money. But I want you to do that after you do the 10, 10, 10. You need to be doing 10% into savings, 10% 10% into um, investments, and you need to be giving away a portion of that which you bring in. Now, you can certainly argue with me that maybe the 10% giving doesn't come until you're out of debt, things of that nature. That's that's fine, whatever it is for you. But definitely make sure that you're doing at least 10% investing and at least 10% saving. It was so wonderful yesterday with my other class. Five of the students in there had opened a Roth IRA and they had bought VOO. And one of the ladies in the class actually got to hit the button right in front of me. She bought $201 of VOO. I was so happy. And she was so happy. And her parents were so happy. She was like, oh, my mom and dad are ecstatic that I'm getting involved in the world of investing. You've got to start now. Now, I know we've got some in here that are mid uh, you know, mid-career type people, that's fine. We've got some people that are near retirement age, that's fine too. It's always the day to start is today. So many people come up to me and says, Bobby, will you help me with my finances? And I say, sure, what are you doing now? Oh, I can't now. Oh, okay, well, how about tomorrow? Well, I'm not sure about tomorrow. And they'll want my help, but they never end up meeting with me. It's crazy. Uh, people says, hey, let's go out to dinner one day. I said, okay, when? Tell me when. You buy me a steak dinner and I'll give you all the financial advice that I could possibly give to you. And nobody ever takes me out. It's amazing. They probably know I'll eat too much. So you got to start now, ladies and gentlemen, responsible spending. Think about all the things that are in your house right now that are just junk. Think about all the stuff that you probably bought for Christmas that are just junk, that are just sitting around. You know, we buy more than what we need. And the problem is, is that, as Dave Ramsey said, we spend money that we don't have for things that we don't need to impress people that we don't even like. Now, when I was growing up, we didn't have anything. We were really kind of poor. And I think I had one or two pairs of blue jeans, and they were sport about brands from Walmart. Well, my sister, she was embarrassed to wear anything that was from Walmart. So the thing that was real popular back then was guest jeans. Everybody probably, I think guests is still out there, I guess. So guess, I guess that guest jeans are out there. So what she did is she had one pair of guest jeans. Every night she would come home from school and she would cut the logo off the back. She would take needle and thread and sew it onto a generic pair of jeans so that her friends, quote unquote, friends would think that she had a pair of guest jeans for every day of the week. How about that? So she was trying to impress people who really, at this point in their life, after we've been out of high school for 30 or 35 years, you know, what does that mean? It means absolutely nothing. And the older that you get, give me a hands up or a, a, say an amen on this. How many of you, the older that you get, care less and less about what other people think about you? I really don't care what people think about me. There you go, Charlotte. You know, and it's a a liberating feeling when you get to a point that you go, man, I don't care what somebody thinks about me. Screw them. I am me. And this is what I this is what I'm doing. Okay, Tom says that too. Yeah, it's really good. It's an empowering, liberating feeling when you get to that point that you don't care what people think about you. So I want you to think about your spending and I want you to think about it in terms of a of, of a compartment. 70% of what you make goes to spending. Now, is that 70% of your gross pay or is that 70% of your net pay? I would rather, it could be either, 
but I would rather it be 70% of your net pay. Why? Because that means you're actually spending less. Your consumption, if you can cut it down and make it 70% of your net pay after taxes, that's the way to do it. As far as your giving, your saving, and your investing, I would love to see that as a percentage of your gross pay so that you're actually putting more into those buckets. So four buckets. We got a bucket to spend, we got a bucket to save, we got a bucket to invest, and we got a bucket to give. So simple. Anybody can do this budgeting. Have anybody started on this at all? Have you started on this budget? I'd be curious to hear from you. Well, this is, this is Jason, um, absolutely. Um, and even with our daughter, she's seven years old and she gets a $6 allowance where she gets to keep $3 to do whatever she wants with. $2 has to go to savings and $1 has to go to charity. So we're trying to get this imbued into, into a seven-year-old right now. Oh, Jason, that's awesome. Hey, uh, Jason, if you'll send me your uh, address I will send and your daughter's name, I will send her a children's book that I've written called Blossom Possum Learns to Save. So if you'll send me that email uh, message, I'll send your daughter a book, okay? I'll sign it for her. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so spending, anyone got a question on spending at all? Spending 70%, y'all, 70%. Now that's your credit card payments too, y'all. And whatever you spend on your credit card, that is part of your 70%. We'll talk about debt later and we're not going to talk about it today. I think debt comes up next week, but we're talking about responsible spending. Don't worry about keeping up with everybody. And just because your mom and dad said that you need a brand new four by four pickup truck doesn't mean that you need a brand new four by four pickup truck. Just doesn't. I drive a 2011 Nissan Rogue that I am so excited for. I hope I get a million miles out of it. I've got 192 on it right now. And I just hope I get a million out of it. And the greatest thing is, I don't care that it's a 2011. I love it because I know every time I drive it, it's something that's like paid for, has never had a payment on it. We don't have a payment on my wife's 2020 Toyota Sienna minivan because we got five kids. You know, it's paid for. All of our vehicles are paid for. You don't want to have a car payment if at all possible. So get rid of those as well. Can you imagine not having a $500, $400, $500 car payment and actually putting that money into savings every month so that the next time that you go buy a car, you can buy one that's absolutely positively paid for. Oh, wow. Cash is king, baby. You can make deals with cash going in there. And just so if you don't have a car payment now and you're thinking, oh, I need another car, make your car payment now instead of making it to someone else that you're having to pay interest. The problem is the, um, the, the wealthy don't pay interest on things that go down in value. The wealthy pay interest on things that go up in value. For example, a house, a business, um, maybe margin interest to buy stock. They pay interest on things that go up in value. They don't pay uh, interest on things that go down in value. So you would want to pay your car off as quickly as possible. So that's the power of, of, of responsible spending. Now, the power of saving. This is great, too. The great thing about saving is that it allows you to enjoy life now. We talk about the investment, investment component. Well, the investment component is that which gets you to retirement and beyond your working year so that you'll have money for that. The power of saving is accomplished in something that you need to get something at really, really quickly. Now, where are you going to put those saving dollars? You're going to put them into a savings account at a bank or credit union, or you're going to put those into U.S. Treasuries, or you're going to buy a Treasury ETF like BIL, B as in boy, I as in indigo, L as in lizard. BIL is a great ETF that pays a monthly dividend, and it right now is the, giving you the equivalent return of about 5% a year. So in your stock portfolios that you've got with the uh, uh, in, now, you could actually buy bill in those. And what I do is I buy bill up to 
percent of the portfolio. Let me show you show you this. This is kind of cool. And this is just a component of one of the accounts that I trade. So here, let's see, let me hide everything here. Let's do this. Let's do this. All right. So here you'll see that um, this is an account that is $464,000, $465,000. Here's a $40,000 account. And you can see that I'm using up to 99% of my buying power. Whoa. Bobby, that's probably more than you need to use, man. That's a lot of buying power. In other words, the collateral for the options that I've sold here are, are taking up, you know, 99%. Well, that's not entirely correct because look what I have here. My options positions in the E-mini S&Ps are only taking up 152000 of my uh, capital. And then I've got the remainder. I just went out and flat out bought bill. Look at this. So $311,000 of my um, buying power is taken up by bill. In this particular account, we own 3,390 shares of bill. 3,390 shares of bill. What's this? This thing is going to go X dividend tomorrow. What does that mean? That means that people that are of record as of today's date, not tomorrow, they will base it on today's date. X dividend date is too late to buy it. As of today, it goes X dividend tomorrow and it's expected to pay 42 cents per share. 42 cents times 3,390 means that we're going to get a check in seven days, not a check, they're going to deposit it into our account of $1,423. And that's every month now that rates are up at about 5%. So these guys actually actually uh, pay a dividend based on what you would get. So this is a ETF that holds one to three month treasury bills. All right. Now you can also let's show you this. Everybody see the screen? Okay. What's this? We can, I can show you how to buy T bills as well. So let's say that you want to just don't want to do the bill, but you want to just go in and buy treasury bills. So you can log into your TDA TD Ameritrade account, or some of you are doing, I guess, with Schwab. Mine's old. So TD Ameritrade has been acquired by Schwab. So not sure what you would see, but I'll just kind of give you an example. Here's an account. This is my Roth IRA. And I could go in and buy some T bills. Now, y'all think you'd be talking about this at Thanksgiving or Easter with your family, and they'll think you're really something. So I hit trade tab. I go bonds and CDs. I go U.S. Treasury, zero to one year. Now, you can do one to three years, however long you want to do it, but I generally need liquidity. I need to have this money in case some of my options positions go against me. So that's why. Uh, and then go on to new issues. Treasury auctions, zero to one year, and then you can actually buy a four-week treasury. Look at that. Buy four-week, buy eight-week. Normally, the longer out in weeks that you go, the farther, the higher the interest rate. Not always this case, but I like liquidity. So I'll go to the four and the eight-week, and then you can say, okay, I'm going to buy three of these. Well, how much does that cost for you to do that? So you buy these treasury bills at a discount. So let's say that I'm buying one, it's a thousand dollar face value, but the current value of that, I'm paying $990. So that at expiration in four weeks, you will be paid the $10 in interest or whatever the amount of interest is on it. So you can go review order. And it'll say, are you sure? Review your order. We're buying three. Yes, it's going to face value of 3000 Uh Maturity is on March 5th. Uh, settlement of these funds is on February the 6th. And just hit place order. And then you bought T-bills, treasury bills. Any questions about treasury bills at all? Cool thing about treasury bills is they are not taxed by the state. They don't have any state income taxes on them.
it's really kind of cool. I just did my taxes, by the way. So I was like, oh, yay, no no uh, state income tax on that. Also, we were looking earlier, we were thinking about bill. If we buy bill instead of the treasuries, does that mean that we still get that tax benefit? And from our research, it does appear that if you buy bill, that the dividends that you receive in bill, you don't have to pay state income taxes on those as well. So I'm gonna, I want to have a, a call with the bill people just to make sure the bill ETF people to double check that. But from what we kind of, I say research, we Googled it. So as everybody does to see if those are subject to state income taxes and it appears that it is not. So I will confirm with the actual bill ETF people that came up with it just to make sure that that is the case. I don't want to give you any false information. So that's where you save your money. You don't save your money in a Robinhood account. You don't save your money in uh, in high risk things. You need liquidity. That's why when I'm buying a four week T bill, I know that that money will be available in my account within four weeks. You need liquidity in case the air conditioner or heat goes out in your car or it goes out in your home or your house is infested with termites and you got to have a repair, whatever the case, you want that money available. Okay. All right. Now let's go to the final part of what we need to talk about. And that's the power of compound interest. I want you to know this website, investor.gov. Very seldom does the government do anything that's worthwhile but apparently they do have a wonderful website that has a wonderful calculator and it's investor.gov and just go to their calculators and they've got a compound interest calculator, which is really, really cool. So I was speaking to a young lady at Ramburn High School in Ramburn, Alabama, uh, speaking to their high school class. And I was basically saying, listen, what do you want to do for a living? And I was going through all these the kids and this young lady said, well, I want to be a teacher, but I can't be a teacher because they won't make enough money. So I got to choose something else. And I said, really? You don't think that a teacher makes that much money, huh? So we Googled to see what a starting teacher would be in Alabama. And we came up with uh, with uh, $40,000. So we're going to assume that that person never gets a raise, never gets a cost of living raise, and that the initial investment here is going to be zero dollars. Now, remember, we said that you need to contribute at least 10 percent in here. So I showed this young lady that would be four thousand dollars a year. Right. So you take four. Th I can't do math in my head. Four thousand dollars. Divided by 12. Is three hundred and thirty three dollars. So let's say she puts in three hundred and thirty three dollars a month. Length of time in years. Okay, so right now, she would be 22 by the time she gets out of college. So let's say she didn't start to there. So 65, let's say she's going to retire at 65 minus 22. That gives her 43 years for this money to grow. Estimated interest rate. Well, we kind of figured out that the S&P over time, depends on what period of time you look at, but you should be able to get 8, 9, 10% interest. So we said estimated interest rate and compound annually. So she will be putting $4,000 a year times 43 years. She'll be putting in $172,000. Anybody want to guess how much money she'll have by putting $172,000 in it in 43 years? Anybody want to guess? Dave, you got a guess? I'm sorry, I've actually taken a client call. <laughs> oh, that's fine, Dave. Go back to that. Yeah, I put you to sleep. Oh, I'm back to class now. Sorry okay. So, Dave, she's going to put away $172,000 over 43 years. She's going to get 10% interest because she's in the S&P 500. That's about what it averages. How much do you think she's going to get by the time she retires at age 65? Any, any idea? If she's, she's investing $172,000. Uh... That was a lot of mental math. <laughs> just, just throw Seven, out a guess. 700 grand? 700 grand. So let's calculate. Ready? 
And let's see how our young lady does. She's at $2.367 million. This is where I drop the mic and cut the video off and say, see you next week. Ladies and gentlemen, it starts slow to begin with, right? This is her amount that she's contributed. Look at this. But look at those exponential earnings. It was Albert Einstein that said the time value of money is the eighth wonder of the world. It is a force to be reckoned with. She only puts in 172000 but the young lady has $2.3 million at retirement. Now, I could hear an 18 or 22-year-old looking at me and saying, yeah, but Dr. Bob, that's at 65. I mean, my God, I want to enjoy myself now. Hey, that's what that other 10% is in your savings. That's your vacation to Switzerland. That's your next pickup truck. That's your whatever. That's your nice little sewing machine that you want to buy one day. Or that's your nice little, you know, vacation to Panama City Beach that you want to go to or to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. That's where that money comes from is your savings. So save and invest. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me show you how our government could do away with poverty if they wanted to. Let's say that the federal government, instead of paying all this for food stamps and all these social programs that don't work, let's say that every time a baby was born in the United States, let's say the government put an account for those kids of $1,000 into an account just for that child. And let's say that that child's not going to need it until 65, and they invest it into the S&P 500, $1,000 per child. That would be cheap, y'all. I don't know how many kids we have uh, born a, a year, but you could cut that money that we're giving to Ukraine and give some of this to the kids, right? And say, I'll put $1,000 in the account. Well, it must be invested in the S&P 500 that historically gets about a 10% return, and we will let them have it at retirement. How much would $1,000 grow to? I want you to come up with a number in your head by the time that child was 65 and needing it for retirement. You ready for this? We could do away with poverty in the United States. What's this? Calculate. They would have 490000 They only contributed $1,000. Well, we all know that the eggheads in our government are never going to do something as smart as this so that people can have $490,000. You imagine if you put 2000 in there. Well, it'd be almost at a million dollars. That crazy and a relatively cheap thing. So, so those of you that are parents or grandparents, you need to do this for your child. You need to set them up a Roth IRA. Now, they need to have some earned income. So you need to have to pay them for cutting your grass or doing something. You know, they cleaned your house or washed your car or something. It needs to be earned income. Or you use their picture as a baby uh, for a Roth IRA uh, for your business purposes. You put it on a flyer and put it in your business and you paid the kid $1,000. Something. You got to come up with something because you have to have earned income with a Roth IRA. But the important thing is if they did this in a Roth IRA, this money is not even taxable at retirement. There's no tax on that $489,000 worth of earnings. You can do this. Now let's say that, okay, this sounds great, Dr. Bob. I'm going to put $1,000 in and let them have it at 65 and a Roth IRA. This is, this is wonderful. What's this? Now let's say if you only contribute 10 extra dollars a month, that's nothing. 10 extra dollars a month. And that's all they invest for the remainder of their life. You do it until they're 18. And after that, you say, okay, Johnny, son, you got to put in $10 a month. What's this, y'all? What's this? Let's calculate how much we got there. You have doubled it, over doubled it. By only putting in uh, $10 a month, you have a million dollars. Now, can you imagine some of you that says, hey, you know, I think I could put more than that. What if we actually said a very reasonable number for your grandkids, we're going to put $50 a month in there, and that's what they're going to put in there as well. Can you imagine? $3.4 million. What happens if you put $100 in every month? 
Can you imagine? $6.3 million at retirement. Literally, that's probably more than they're going to spend in retirement. Now, I know that inflation, blah, 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 $6 million is not going to go as far as it goes to the – I got all that. But I'm telling you something. There are ways, ladies and gentlemen, that you can change your family tree. It just takes time. It takes time. And the best time for you to start with your kids, your grandkids, and even yourself is now. Now, here's the thing. Don't give a dime to your grandkids until you have got your house in order. you got to have your house in order before the kids' house is in order. That's for your parents and you grandparents out there. Make sure that you're funding your retirement so that they don't have to wash your butt and wipe your butt when you're in a nursing home or living with them because you don't have the money to go to a nursing home. It starts now. Who's got a question about the time value of money? Isn't that great, though? The time value of money, the eighth wonder of the world. So I want you guys to start now. All right? That's our lecture for the day. I hope you have a wonderful day. I will see y'all next week.